Just by way of background, I spent 20 years as sort of a hardcore oil and gas lawyer, asset transactions, joint ventures, and then about uh, four and a half years ago, I um, sort of uh, hooked up with a private equity provider out of Houston, and it's uh, Quantum Energy Partners, and they had a portfolio company up here, and um, what they do is they provide private equity to First Nations to do their own projects um, and to partner with industry to do projects. So it's kind of the, the opposite of what usually happens. And in, in, a, in a course of, of that work, we sort of uh, yeah, put in context some of the things that, that, uh, that they've been doing over the last kind of 30 years and uh, work towards uh, uh, in, in, with Canadian Indigenous uh, communities in the north and with sort of the, uh, uh, the coming of UNDRA and uh, uh, pre prior informed consent, what are some of the strategies, what are some of the tools that Canadian energy companies are going to need to address this, this issue that's coming. So what I'm going to do is just run through quickly uh, traditional lands from a human rights perspective, UNDRA informed consent, talk about the business case for alignment, and that's really what the point of this is, is that you can go from on this continuum from philanthropy to corporate social responsibility and through to share value creation. Usually I get to talk to there's not professors here. <laughs> I just I just Google stuff. But in, in any event, where you get to is that the philanthropy is, is just money that you give away and dissipates very quickly. Corporate social responsibility for my purposes, it's, it's an investment, but it's not, it doesn't increase your, your internal rate of return on this project. It might help you down the road, get a new project, something else. But what we're talking about is shared value creation is that by partnering in clever and innovative ways, you're going to increase your rate of return on this project. And that's by partnering with the communities that you operate in. And this is, of course, specifically about indigenous communities in Canada, but it's applicable to practically anything or any community um, in the larger sense. United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, it's a human rights uh, document that says that in order for a uh, uh, Indigenous people to enjoy their human rights, they need uh, protection of their collective rights. Um, uh, 2007, uh, Canada and the US, Australia, New Zealand, we signed it, uh, Canada, 2010, we get around to sign it, but we didn't we said that we have to sign it because we apply to us again back Canada. Uh, uh, but what it is, is it's sort of a, a minimum human rights, uh, sets out a set of minimum human rights principles that Indigenous communities uh, need to see adhered to in order to enjoy those basic uh, human rights. Um, and you know, we talk about it provides guidance for involvement in practices or activities inconsistent with broadly held views on their human rights. We cannot say to our oil company friends who pay us money that you're committing human rights abuse or a violation, but we just talk about inconsistencies. So what they're doing is inconsistent. Um, Canadian Truth, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a uh, you know, fantastic set of documents. Uh, uh, Basically, in Canada, that all kinds of terrible things uh, have happened to our indigenous communities at the uh, really initiative of, of the federal government, among others. But uh, buried in there is, is a recommendation that uh, we we'll bring in uh, UNDRIP and start to observe uh, the right of uh, free, prior, and informed consent of uh, indigenous communities impacted by development. Rachel comes in. Seems good for Alberta. Justin comes in, on side for Canada. All of a sudden, Cap's on side, everybody's on side. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> it's really complicated because we have all sorts of history in the number of treaties and Supreme Court decisions and our Constitution and all this stuff. And it doesn't quite fit with the way uh, things have, have been going. Uh, historically, um, so you know, we, we talk about we, we mush together consent with all the principles enshrined in Canadian constitutional law. So, I'm going to give you some stuff, I'm going to take it back. Um, I think we all know, pardon, 
other than President-elect Trump and Billy <laughs> Bush, we all know what consent means. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, you would try to say, well, consent it doesn't mean veto. Yeah, that doesn't work. But anyway, so, so there's, that, there's that part of it. But the other, the, the, the part that I think Canada and Alberta, Saskatchewan, are really going to struggle with is this idea of both lands and territories and other resources. Because um, we have, yeah, historical treaty lands, so the lands that were surrendered pursuant to the treaties. And then there's, uh, outside of that, there's traditional lands that are subject to claims, where, where indigenous communities historically did things, and they, and they don't overlap. They're not the same things. So you'll have 20 or 30 nations sign a treaty, they each have their own lands. You've got all these uh, complicated ideas and, and, and definitions around what land you're talking about. And then, the language in Andhra is lands and territories. And again, it's, it's not clear how that definition and how it's uh, sort of been interpreted internationally, how that's going to apply to us. Um, and yet, this is an informed consent matrix, strength of claim on the bottom, impact of development on the top, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, back in the day on the far right at the bottom, you know, on reserve, nations had to consent to activity. It makes total sense. It's their land, basically. And then we have Chilcotin comes in, um, the court finds Aboriginal title. They own it. Of course they should have it. It makes total sense. And then with Andrea, what you, what you do is you, you move that fuzzy part between uh, consent and accommodation further and further to the left, right? So you're going to have instances where in traditional territories, uh, one or more nations are going to have, uh, if we're going to fully adopt uh, under it, they're going to be able to consent and veto uh, activity. Um, so, yeah, so the next part I want to touch on is this business case for alignment talk about above ground risk, right? So if you don't partner in constructive ways with the communities that you operate in, all sorts of bad things happen. All expensive, not good, fancy people at Harvard, everywhere. It's, it's, it's well documented. Um, so there, there's a real economic case for making your project move smoothly forward because you're going to incur a bunch of costs, delays, all sorts of things. There's capital provider requirements through um, the UN uh, Global Compact, uh, the principles for responsible investment, equity principles, all these sorts of. Uh, uh, restrictions that have been imposed by capital providers on conducting uh, your activities and, and go, going forward, if you look at the uh, full implementation of UNDRIP, Canadian companies operating here seeking uh, funding are going to be bound by a lot more sort of uh, high value, uh, oh, high value, but uh, things that we never, never had to think about before. And then we're going to touch on this, this is again, fancy people at Harvard, creating shared value. It's, it's this sort of idea that, that you know, there, there's, there's a way, if you, if you spend time understanding the communities that you're working in and how your operation is going to intersect with them, that there's ways to um, create additional value for both people. Um, and I, I, at the end of this, I'll get to some, some examples, or some specific examples that, that I've been in, in, involved with. But I mean, it's a, uh, improvements in company operations, supply chain costs, labor costs. If you can have workers that live two miles from the facility instead of having to fly them up in Calgary, of course that's cheaper, right? So if you have to build a school so that they can get their grade 12 and then you can have send them to Nate and then you have workers, of course it's work. It, you know, there's, there's that side of things, um, you know, revenue generated from, from uh, electricity. Um, when you're when you're evaluating things or in an exit or monetization transaction, your, your relationship with the community is becoming more and more important. There's you know, quite a bit of uh, yeah uh, research done on the discount applied to uh, operations that don't have good relationships with, with the communities. So 
when you look at the Canadian context, you've got all this sort of data around um, basically every natural resource and energy project is going to impact multiple First Nations in Canada. There's sort of 600 major energy development projects valued at $650 billion, and all of them are planned by one or more Aboriginal communities. So this idea that you know, if, if, if you know, we need a strategy to go forward about how we're going to structure relationships with communities um, and then get to the actual thing I'm going to talk about. Um, so when you're partnering with communities at, at a higher level, there's sort of three buckets of advantages that you can um, bestow on a community. And one of them is sort of passive uh, revenue or uh, in the form of royalties or a share of, of, of the crown's uh, take or bonuses. Or, you know, there's, a, there's this sort of uh, passive revenue source. And that's, in some ways, at certain times, that, that might help uh, uh, communities bring in their growth. Um, but then you, you go through the, the next bucket is sort of contractual preferences for training, employment opportunities, and procurement opportunities for member owned and nation owned businesses. So, you know, that's it. And there's a whole, all kinds of su success stories with uh, Fort Mackay, you know, really, really great stuff. And the third, and, and what, what, uh, what I work with or focus on is direct equity participation or active working interest in the project itself. And what it does is, is take the community from being uh, at loggerheads with the project to become a partner in the project. So they need, they want the project to succeed rapidly as bad or worse than you. So they become your biggest proponent. And if you're, um, yeah, and so when you're making your application, if you've got the nation there alongside of you, there's a different door for you. It's, it's a completely different situation. Um, benefits of equity participation provides communities with a voice in decision making, aligns the interests with the, uh, those of the energy developer, increases self reliance by providing a line of sight to meaningful wealth creation, financial sovereignty. Uh, and there's a, you know, and, yeah, uh, that community takes years to build a relationship with an indigenous community to, to have this sort of thing. And it's, it's, uh, it's very, 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 uh, rewarding at the end of it, uh, but it's all about education and the kind of transfer of expertise um, and, uh, yeah, depending on, on how sophisticated, but I can tell you about how, uh, how advanced the government is in the sort of transparency issues, all sorts of things, different, different communities need a lot more help to understand, firstly, what they've been through, what their needs are, where they, where they have to go, what it takes to get there. Uh, but the, the idea is that if they're their partner and the project works out, they're going to have their own source of revenue and their own asset base in order to provide for their community, which is really what, as a government, that's what they try to do. Uh, I mean, you know, I've come to see First Nations as um, you know, sort of large land-based, sparsely populated municipalities that are, you know, for the most part, located in remote areas, right? And, but they have a tax base, so they have to look to the federal government for all their revenue. So if you give them something to generate revenue, they make the changes. Um, the struggles, the challenges is you have to allocate the amount of equity between the developer and the affected communities. Um, you have to allocate interest among the affected uh, communities, and that's by far the toughest. Uh, in the joint infrastructure, governance is restrictions on alienation and exit mechanisms. I get to leave you going because the nation can't sell their interest because then there's no one in line. Right? So that's just sort of, you have to structure things differently. And the last is securing investment capital for the And this used to be a problem, but now it's it's uh, it's incredibly easy to line up money if the project is good. I mean, the um, uh, Suncorp announced uh, uh, their uh, tank farm a couple weeks ago, and they got given up 50% of it, and the way that was structured for the nation's side of the capital um, is it's large, it's, it's $500 million. But the way it was structured was such a secure investment that five banks were bidding to fund the nation's side. And it's just all that, uh, that side of So some people get something they need to build, and they don't have to pay for it. So it's a win, it's a win. 
okay, this is just a little bit of um, long story. If you recall, 2014, James and I, who is the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur, which is a fantastic word. Uh, so he came out, toured Canada, Canada bad, Alt bad, missing women bad, fresh water, substance, everything bad. But look at paragraph 77, and he talks about resource extraction to encourage, um, that encourages indigenous participation in economic uh, development activities and benefits. He mentioned specifically two companies and this pitch. Get ready for it. So these are, these are the two two of the companies that we created uh, when I worked with a company called Native American Resource Partners, which is a, the primary equity funded uh, uh, portfolio company. And so one of them was the Blood Nation. The Blood Nation is the largest land base uh, first nation in Canada, 300 and 50,000 acres, and then just uh, west of Lethbridge, so we uh, acquired 200,000 acres, drove a bunch of wells, and all over 26 bucks, so that's the best. Great idea. I've welcomed that. Wow. Um, uh, Tribal Morph is, is uh, a service, oil field services company in Treaty 6 and Treaty 8, and it is a uh, 19 out of 20 of the employees are First Nation, and it's got uh, you know, $16 million worth of really high tech super heaters that you can track water. And these are just different advantages that they're able to bring. Uh, I'll just touch on one that the, the development plan for the Bloods is it's four or 600 big horizontal wells with 60,000 cubes of water, of frack water each. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to drill them all, you have to truck all that in, truck all that out. But, because of the agricultural blood, the blood for, had a blood for having the agricultural project. The idea was that we would just build an irrigation system that would take all the water, even all the water out, and use it this system. So it's, it saved them a ton of money, and gave them a ton of money because it's going to irrigate all, all that that wasn't otherwise irrigated. And uh, building the irrigation system is cheaper than trying. So, uh, I'll talk more a little bit about the yeah, so, yeah, because if nations work on reserve, they don't pay taxes, so you can bid competitively on jobs for lower, because you have certain inherent advantages in terms of uh, this is basic structure, uh, no financial equipment or components of the nation, you sort of, uh, you know, there's just a contribution of interest, rights, influence, whatever the nation has in their basket of goodies, it gives them something of interest, they contribute that. Uh, in, our, in this case, you can get private equity from somewhere, and then you sort of have this uh, return of, of capital provided for private equity. It's a lot, but the end, the end of the day is after there's a payout of everything, the nation buys uh, NARC out, and they end up with 100% owned, uh, functioning, profitable, uh, Company, their service company, or their oil company, and um, yeah, they're able to take it there and and, uh, and uh, they go forth and prosper. The best, the best uh, poster child of this is a sub called uh, Southern Ute uh, Nation, which is just in Southern Colorado. It's a guy who runs I mean, American Resource Partners. We started working with them about 30 years ago, uh, managing their resource estate, and uh, they're worth I think, 16 million. Five member travel community is uh, you know, an extreme well. 